Hello and welcome, I'm Ali Mustafa and this is Straight Talk. The Iraqi military retakes oil-rich Kirkuk without a fight. Why it may shed light on a crisis in leadership in the KRG. Plus, Somalia's deadliest terror attack. Is foreign intervention the answer or the problem? And Cairo cuts a deal with Hamas and Fatah to make amends. But what's driving Egypt's involvement? We've got a special show today from TRT World's first annual forum where hundreds of policymakers and thinkers have come together to debate how to inspire change in an age of uncertainty. And one country that encapsulates this theme is Iraq. A delicate balance between the nation's ethnic groups has been put to the test in Kirkuk. Once allies in the fight against Daesh, the Iraqi army and Kurdish Peshmerga fighters are now pointing their guns at each other. The tensions ramped up after a contentious referendum by the Kurdish Regional Authority asking for independence. Reignited claims over disputed cities like oil-rich Kirkuk. Iraq says the area was stolen in a land grab by the Peshmerga in 2014, but now they say they've taken it back with the help of Shia militias. And we've heard reports that Peshmerga mostly stood by as the troops moved in. Thousands of the city's Arabs, Kurds and Turkmen fled earlier this week over fears that clashes would break out. And to discuss the situation in Iraq further, I'm joined from Ankara by the Iraqi ambassador to Turkey, Hisham al alawi Thank you for joining us, sir. Why do you think the Peshmerga resistance disintegrated around Kirkuk? Was this the result of a deal between some Kurdish factions and the central government in Baghdad? Thank you very much for having me. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The uh, redeployment plan was a very coordinated plan. The commander-in-chief and the central government uh, worked together with the local provincial officials and the uh, leadership of the uh, Peshmergas, mainly that are under the control of the PUK. Uh, there was a, uh, an agreement to uh, allow the Iraqi security forces to uh, exercise their full authority over the uh, federal institutions and the provincial buildings in the province. There were some elements that uh, tried to resist the advance uh, and prevent the advance of the Iraqi security forces, mainly those that were under the control uh, and uh, leadership of the uh, Democratic uh, Party with uh, some elements from the PKK and some also Daesh personnel. Uh, the operations, as you notice, was uh, very successful, quick, and the three main goals were achieved uh, without uh, much delay, i.e. to uh, recontrol the federal institutions and the government building, uh, to protect the citizens and uh, ensure their well-being, and to recontrol the, uh, the oil fields, uh, the uh, air bases, and um, other important federal institutions in the province. You are saying that there was an agreement and understanding between the Iraqi forces, between Baghdad and the PUK. What kind of cooperation are we talking about and is this coordination still continuing? Yes, it is continuing. The, it is based on the simple fact that uh, uh, the, all, uh, all of security forces have to be under the control of the commander-in-chief and the central government, uh, any, uh, any local forces that would resist the Iraqi security forces uh, would be acting illegally. As you know, there is also a wide uh, criticism of the way the uh, regional uh, government has behaved. Uh, and in a way, uh, the, uh, the, the events unfolded in the way they have uh, because of this background as well. 
just for the benefit of our viewers, Ambassador, just to tell them the layout of the various political groups that are operating in northern Iraq. You've got the Kurdistan Democratic Party led by Masoud Barzani. You've got the Patriotic Union of uh, Kurdistan, which was led by the late Jalal Talibani. And you've got the Goran Movement for Change. But there's also the offshoots of the PKK, a group that Turkey considers to be a terrorist organization. We heard some reports as well from the Iraqi side that PKK fighters had been deployed. These allegations that the PKK was taking part uh, in and around Kirkuk. Tell us the Iraqi government's position on the PKK and if we can expect any coordinated military operations uh, between Ankara and Baghdad against the PKK in Iraq. As you know, the position of the Iraqi central government is very clear on this issue. The Iraqi constitution does not allow any foreign organization to have a base in Iraq and to wage operations that could threaten the national security of uh, neighboring countries. In this case, uh, PKK. As far as Kirkuk is concerned, uh, we, we are not talking about accusations or allega unfounded allegations. They were. Uh, there are well-documented reports confirming that uh, uh, hundreds of, of PKK members uh, were there. They tried, obviously, to, uh, to fight uh, the, uh, and prevent the advance of the Iraqi security forces. The Iraqi government, obviously, is keen to enhance security, military, intelligence cooperation with Turkey. Turkey has a military base, a small military presence in the Bashika area, which was controlled on, up until recently by the Peshmerga. Now, the Iraqi forces, we're getting reports, have moved in there. What kind of military cooperation can we expect? Can we expect a military cooperation between Turkey and Baghdad? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, this would be in the interest of both countries. We, as you know, the position of the Iraqi central government has been uh, that we need to resolve the Bashirka camp issue and the recent developments on the grounds make it relatively easier to uh, resolve this issue quickly. Uh, this will obviously open up the way to enhance security, military, intelligence cooperation between the two sides. There was an important visit by the Iraqi uh, army chief of staff uh, and uh, he is expected to come soon also to Turkey to follow up on the uh, pre uh, discussions, to follow up the previous discussions. Uh, the kind of uh, security, military, intelligence cooperation between the two sides will be an important uh, 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 part of the discussions he is expected to have with his counterpart. Uh, we are, as I said, keen to work together to secure the borders, to uh, also exercise full control over uh, the national border gates, uh, to work together to establish the new border gate that we have agreed to, to have and also to uh, protect the, uh, the oil pipelines that uh, are used to export oil from the northern uh, fields in Iraq to uh, uh, Jehan uh, port. You're, of course, talking about this new border gate that has uh, been offered by Turkey to Baghdad to by bypass the KRG. Speaking specifically about Kirkuk, there have been some suggestions made in Iraq and in Turkey to invoke Article 140 of the uh, Iraqi constitution, which calls for a referendum to be held in disputed areas such as Kirkuk. Is this a viable option to invoke Article 140? Well, as you know, uh, Article 140 has three important uh, elements. One, the first one is normalization, i.e. to uh, make arrangements for the citizens of Kirkuk province who were forced to leave their homes to go back. Uh, the second element was uh, the census. We were supposed to have a census to confirm who, is, uh, uh, who has the right to vote. And the third element is the referendum. As part of uh, the preparation for those uh, steps, I, I think it's important to ensure peace and uh, uh, security in the province and to work with the local uh, government to prepare the uh, right environment for having the census and then the referendum. Ambassador Alawi, thank you for joining us from Ankara. It was the deadliest attack
to hit the country in its history. Somalia is recovering from a bombing that killed hundreds of people at the heart of Mogadishu. Plagued by instability and civil war for three decades, its residents are no strangers to tragedy. But that was all supposed to change after years of foreign intervention. Turkey has been one of the nations at the forefront of providing aid and assistance to Somalia and recently opened its biggest overseas military base there. Will it play a more prominent role now in efforts to secure a fragile nation? Omer Kablan reports. <laughs> A truck packed with hundreds of kilograms of explosives went off at the heart of Somalia's capital. It was one of the most lethal terrorist attacks in the world, killing more than 300 people and leaving hundreds seriously injured. Rescuers continue to find more victims. No group has come forward to say it carried out the attack but suspicion is falling on Al-Shabaab. The armed group that has used bombings, shootings and grenade attacks to try to regain control of Mogadishu after it was driven out in 2011. World leaders from the United States, UK, Canada, France and Turkey strongly condemned the truck bombing. Ankara has a close relationship with Mogadishu and immediately dispatched teams of medical experts to tend to the injured. But those with serious injuries have been flown to Turkey, the country which has become a refuge for many Somalis. This neighborhood in Istanbul, known as Little Mogadishu, is home to hundreds of Somali refugees seeking solace from the disasters that have devastated Somalia for decades. And the most recent terror attack there makes it difficult for those who want to return. But can the international community turn that around? Just around the corner from the neighborhood, I met Ismail Siad, a Somali student. Turkey has also provided scholarships to thousands of Somali students, which I am part of, and those students have almost, uh, many of them have already finished their studies and went back home and serve in the country as we speak right now. I also met Hassan Abdi Hassan. He's a researcher at the East Africa Association. So Hassan, what do you think is necessary for Somalia to be a stable and secure country? It needs a stronger government first, strong leadership, strong uh, security forces, so uh, the change and the achievement in terms of security will be coming from the institutional infrastructure of the government. Still, we have the desire to become people. We have the desire to live life as humans. We have the desire to prosper and develop. So that's what uh, gives me faith in the country. Like many of his compatriots who want to go back and rebuild their country, Hassan is hopeful that one day Somalia would return to peace and prosperity. Ahmad Kablan, Straight Talk. And to discuss the latest in Somalia further, I'm joined by Mehmet Oskan, who is an associate professor at the Turkish National Police Academy, and he's also one of the leaders at the Turkish Cooperation and Coordination Agency, or TIKA, and by Ahmed Bedir, who is a Middle East and North Africa analyst, and he's also the president of United Voices, a Washington, D.C.-based organization focusing on minority political engagement. Let's begin with you, Ahmed. Billions of dollars have been invested in Somalia for security, for infrastructure. Have these resources and this investment gone in vain. Judging from what happened last weekend, it doesn't seem like that, but um, when overcoming violence and extremism, these things take generations. Uh, you have to continue investing in education, health care, countering and addressing social justice issues and uh, democratization and making sure that there's no corruption. And unless you do that and you do it for a long term, uh, the, you know, violence can continue. Uh, it happens in a vacuum. When there's political instability, there's no government, 
groups like Al-Qaeda and Al-Shabaab will try to move in to take over because of that political instability. What the international community has to do is continue to invest in these key institutions and especially education. And when the lives of ordinary Somalians start changing, then people will less likely start joining um, these groups, stop joining these groups, and uh, because they have something to hope for. Mehmet, a lot of those billions and billions of dollars that Ahmed is talking about have come from Turkey. Where is this money going to and have the investments been wise? I think what Turkey did in the last five, six years, I mean, if you look at Somalia in 2011, and comparing with 2017 today, I mean, it's totally different Somalia we see today. I mean, 2010, 2011, you know, Somalia was not even on the agenda of the international community. It was not, not existent. It was a state that nobody wants to hear about it. But today, Somalia, at least we are talking about it. Of course, we are talking less, but we are talking about it. And so, I mean, the case of Somalia requires, I mean, lots of time. I mean, we, there is no state, there is no functioning economy. I mean, the social order has been broken. There is a security threat. And comp I mean, uh, taking all this together, I mean, it requires time. But what Turkey is doing today, I mean, actually, Turkey is building a second state after the Cy after northern Cyprus in Somalia. I mean, there's a different experience, of course, dynamics are very, very different. And if, if you go to Somalia, it's very different in 2011. I just, I, mean, want to, I just want to add to your point. The Turkish Prime Minister Ben Ali Yildirim at the recently concluded TRT World Forum said this, that Turkey has been providing sustainable aid to Somalia, including for hospitals and livelihood support. And Turkey does not want to take any money. It wants to bring humanitarian relief when the rest of the international community has ignored Somalia. So what is Turkey's ultimate objective in Somalia? Look, I mean, uh, Somalia is a is a special case for Turkey's Africa relations. And Somalia, Turkey went to Somalia pure, purely for humanitarian reasons in 2011. And later on, the Turkey Somalia has been developed from a humanitarian policy to a security policy. As you know, Turkey now has a military base in Somalia. It's part of Turkey's Africa opening since 2002. And I mean, Turkey doesn't expect any any trade, any money from Somalia. I mean, if you want, if if a country wants to invest in, Af in Africa, I think Somalia is the last country to invest in that sense. You know, constantly all the security situation and Shabab and all the other things. Can I just also add that uh, Turkey is rising as a as a regional power and as other European nations and the United States pulls out of Africa and especially Somalia, Turkey is filling that vacuum because as a regional power it comes with the responsibility of being a, a stabilizing force and whether they're going to gain something from it in the short term or the long term it is in the interest of Turkey to make sure that the region is stable because so, if it spins out of control, it's bad for Turkey. So that, that kind of uh, gets to the second question then. Should there be expectations, not just for the Somalis, but for Turkey and other powers on what they want to achieve? Are those goals clearly defined then? They want to make sure that there's no failed states in the region. They don't want to have a failed state in, 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 in uh, Syria or in Iraq or in Somalia. All that causes a security threat. The rise of al-Shabaab, the rise of ISIS is a direct threat to Turkey's uh, interests and neighboring allies. So that, you know, building up military bases there and investing in the infrastructure uh, of Somalia is in the interest of Turkey and in the region. And I think that is uh, Turkey's role in the area now as it rises to become a regional power. Turkey opened its military base this year. It's the largest military base for Turkey outside of Turkey. And 10,000 Somali soldiers are to be trained at the base by 200 Turkish instructors. That's a big, big commitment as far as Turkey is concerned. And as you said, Turkey doesn't want the region to be destabilized, so it's putting in all this money. Should others help? Obviously, they have to, but, you know, Turkey is cleaning up what... Um all, you know, uh, from past colonization in the area. Uh, what's happening in Syria, what's happening in Iraq, these are a result of the, what Europe meddled when they meddled in the region. And um, ever since then, many of these states haven't really, even after independence, they haven't come to uh, full democ uh, democracies, they haven't had uh, real infrastructure. And some would argue that people, some countries in Europe want to keep it that way. They want to keep these failed states. They don't want to have independent states in the region. And I think uh, Turkey's approach to the region is that they have to invest in these states because the success of these states means the success of Turkey as well in the region. They don't want to have a bunch of failed states around them that Turkey has this civilization and economy and infrastructure, but all the neighbors are suffering. That would eventually uh, leak into what's happening here in Turkey. Ahmed Badir, Mehmet Oskan, thank you so much. Thank you. It was a decision that caught many off guard. A decade-long feud between Palestinian groups Hamas 
and Fatah ended after the rival signed a reconciliation agreement in Cairo. Now, deals have been made in the past with high hopes only to end in collapse. But what's different this time is that Hamas has finally agreed to hand over administrative authority of Gaza back to Fatah. That includes joint control of the crucial Rafah crossing with Egypt, which has been working behind the scenes to secure the deal. But what's behind Cairo's involvement? And is it an attempt for the Sisi regime to re-emerge as a regional powerhouse? Courtney Keeley reports. After a decade-long split, six major Israeli-led invasions and a decimated population with more than 44% unemployment, struggling in nearly unlivable conditions in Gaza, Palestinian factions Fatah and Hamas signed an agreement to bring the Gaza Strip under the control of a Palestinian unity government. The reconciliation agreement was signed under the watchful eye of Egyptian intelligence, who kept details relatively under wraps until it was leaked on social media. The deal focuses on integrating Hamas officials into Palestinian Authority ministries and the joint administration of borders. With Palestinian forces under the oversight of Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas overseeing the Rafah border crossing along the Gaza and Egypt border, it's hoped that Egypt will open up the crossing, allowing the free flow of goods and people to help alleviate the debilitating humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been uncharacteristically quiet, but has said Israel won't thwart the reconciliation deal, but won't recognize it either. The deal doesn't include general elections, or absorbing tens of thousands of Hamas fighters from its military wing into a broader force under Abbas's control. Egypt's involvement is a break from the stance President Sisi has held since his 2013 military coup that Hamas is a terrorist organization allied with the Muslim Brotherhood. A certain pragmatism seems to have shifted his view that Egypt needs Hamas's cooperation to stem the flow of Daesh fighters and arms into the Sinai Peninsula near the Egypt-Gaza border. With Hamas's patron Qatar involved in a diplomatic dispute with Saudi Arabia and other Gulf Arab states, Egypt's engagement also reestablishes its role as a power broker in the Middle East at a time when it has been sidelined and alliances are shifting seismically. Courtney Keeley, Straight Talk. And to discuss this Palestinian reconciliation deal further, I'm joined by Maha Azam, who is the head of the Egyptian Revolutionary Council, which promotes democracy and civic society in Egypt, and Rodney Dixon, he's an international human rights lawyer, and among his clients has been the deposed Egyptian president, Mohamed Morsi. Thank you for joining us, both of you. Let's start with you, Maha. What is the calculus for Egypt in trying to push or support this deal? Does this give Egypt street cred on the Arab street? I doubt whether it gives uh, the regime of uh, General Sisi any street cred. I think he's been uh, discredited in his own country and among the masses regionally. But obviously he's posturing for a role uh, in the region, posturing uh, for a role to be the peacemaker in the region. Uh, obviously, we know what's happened in Gaza. We know the years of suffering that the people of Gaza have had to endure because of the policy of the Egyptian uh, regime, particularly under Sisi, the closure of uh, any kind of uh, amenities, of uh, uh, really starving Gaza out. Uh, so in reality, Egypt has been in cahoots with uh, Israel. It has uh, acted as a good ally for 
Israel's policies. And today it is trying to posture itself and to look as if it is the peacemaker uh, and the, the, the country that is going to bring the, the solution to the, the problems of Gaza and the Palestinians. Of course, Hamas and the Palestinians have suffered a great deal, but ultimately this is a deal that is being brokered with uh, the interests of a uh, regime that uh, is a very close ally of Israel, and we need to keep that in mind. Rodney, this isn't the first time that Hamas and Fatah have tried to reach an agreement. Previous agreements have failed. What are the chances of success for this particular agreement, given that it doesn't address major issues like security and politics? Yes, there, there are a lot of question marks uh, and there are a lot of issues still to be resolved. It seems to be only the very first step and it's going to have to be followed very closely. And ultimately, what will be important in assessing whether it progresses or not is the ways in which the serious human rights violations that have occurred um, are addressed and, and also that those that have been perpetrated and continue to be by the Egyptian regime are not overlooked in this process. That's the danger of so much focus on this as, as an initiative, is that what is happening in Egypt is not being looked at or examined closely enough. Tell us, Maha, about the Israeli side of their perspective. Usually anything to do with Hamas, the Israelis come out and say this is illegal, Hamas is a state, you know, sponsor of terrorism, doesn't recognize Israel. But this time, what is different is that the Prime Minister, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has come out and said that he will not cut off ties with the Palestinian Authority and Mahmoud Abbas. What does that tell us? It tells us that the alliance again is between certain parties in the Middle East. Uh, Abbas and Israel and Sisi uh, understand very well that the, 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 the situation in Gaza is explosive that there needs to be some calming of the situation. Hamas itself is in a bind. It needs to deliver to its own people that have suffered a great deal and sacrificed and will continue to struggle, I believe. But the deal is a hard one uh, to carry through. We've just seen the first steps. We need to keep a watchful eye uh, that the interests of the Palestinians are not uh, undermined. And I believe that Hamas will be uh, on the outlook for that and will be very wary of this. As I was mentioning that this deal does not address very important issues like the status of the Qassam Brigades, for example, and the over 20,000 um, soldiers or armed men that they have in Gaza, how, where does this leave Mahmoud Abbas specifically? Because a few weeks ago we saw uh, Dalan, a competitor, go into Gaza with his own proposal. So where does this leave this balance in the Palestinian Authority? It's a, it's a frightening prospect, not just for the Palestinian Authority, because what it's saying is that outside players, uh, even Gulf players, are interfering in such a way that the emergence of Dahlan at this particular moment uh, to broker uh, uh, an agreement that again may be part of the shape of the region as a whole that is not being shaped by the peoples of the region, but certain regimes and parties regionally and internationally that are not necessarily looking looking to the best interests of their people on the contrary. They're looking for an alliance and a shift in the balance of power that will, I believe, benefit Israel and certain parties in the Gulf. Rodney, where does this then leave this peace process and this quest for Palestinian statehood moving forward? Well, it's, it's an important step that, that, that has been taken. But as we've both emphasized, it, it remains to be assessed how it is going to unfold. Uh, and I wish to emphasize that I don't think it can unfold in a positive vein unless the underlying causes of the problem are addressed and unless the serious injustices and violations that have occurred are properly investigated. Thank you so much for your insights. And that's all from us here in Istanbul. If you have any comments or suggestions, do share them with us at hashtag Straight Talk. Until next time, take care and goodbye.